Ephesians chapter number one. Um, tonight, tonight's study is the second, probably of, of a two part. We, we might get we might get one more in uh, entitled the name above every name. And if you're not familiar with that, that is the, the terminology used in the book of Philippians chapter two, which says about Jesus Christ and his exaltation by the father because of his faithfulness. And has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things on earth, the things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well, here in, in, in Colossians, excuse me, in, in Ephesians, and then we'll see Colossians as well, look at verse number 21. As we end the chapter here in verse 21 through 23, Paul says about the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection and ascension, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can be a part of what you are doing in exalting your son, Lord Jesus, both in heaven and earth, Father. We thank you for uh, your graciousness to allow us to be a part of what you're doing by faith alone in Christ alone. You not only save us from the eternal penalty of our sins, but Father, you give us a blessed hope, a hope to share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Father, we don't, we don't take that for granted. We see that that was the, the life of the Apostle Paul. That was the motivating factor of the Apostle to uh, glorify your son in him and uh, in, in himself here and then throughout all eternity paul had that hope to glorify the lord jesus uh to win christ and may we may we all have that same uh hope that same desire father and we're going to learn that from your word so as we look into your word tonight give us greater insight and understanding of these things we thank you in christ's name amen, amen. all right here in ephesians 1 21 look at that verse again verse 21 far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is in, in that which is to come. Now go over to Colossians. Hold your hand here. Go to Colossians 1, the spousal epistle. They, they, they are like husband, uh, wife and husband, the body and the head. Colossians chapter number 1. Look how Paul puts it here. Verse number 16. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. For by him. Okay. He's the issue in Colossians. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Now notice here, he says, visible and invisible. Earlier I was mentioning about these invisible uh, um, uh, forces behind the, the visible. Well, there, there's visible ones we can see as, hu in, as humans, but also invisible we can't, we can't see and perceive with our, uh, with our physical eyes, but they're real. Whether they be thrones, now he mentions the thrones here, we saw last time, he mentions the thrones here, but not in Ephes Ephesians. Because thrones are the, those highest uh, positions, and Ephesians focus on God's devotion to you and me, but Colossians focus on our devotion to Christ. And so he mentions this higher than even those principalities and powers. He mentions, notice, thrones or dominions. Last time we saw thrones. Uh, today we're going to get into dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So we're, we're going to look at these things. Last time we looked particularly at the thrones. Let's do a little review. Go back to, uh, well, hold your hand there in Colossians. Look at Colossians 1, 16 again. Colossians chapter number 1 and verse 16. For by him were all things created. So the Lord Jesus Christ, is the, he is the member of the Godhead who, who created all these things. The, the Godhead worked through the Son to create these things. Uh, what are they? Things in heaven, things that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now, although he created the, the, the entire creature and the creation, he's, he's focusing on certain things, positions of authority and so forth. Verse 16, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Now, look, last time we saw the issue of thrones. First thing I want to, Paul wants us to know, he wants us to know all of these positions. He wants us to understand God's will for the heavenly places. And he wants this to be the motivating, motivating factor, the motivation for our life in Christ. When Paul says about himself in Philippians chapter 3, he says that I might win Christ. 
and I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. He's talking about these things as, as, as that joint heir with Christ. He wants to bear the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ both now and forever by faith. Now watch what he says here. Uh, the reason he tells us about all these positions is that the every name that is named, the Lord Jesus Christ is above all. Um, what's a name? What's in a name? A name describes something. It's a word or phrase that distinguishes or designates a specific person, place, or thing, or a group thereof. In other words, names particularly uh, distinguish someone from another. The name of Jesus, his name is higher than every name. What did Peter say? There's no other name under heaven whereby men are given where we must be saved, right? Once the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished redemption, there's only one person, one name, that humanity have, can go to in order to receive salvation, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Um, what else about a name? It's a, it's a word or phrase that distinguishes and designates a specific person, place, or thing, or a group thereof. Uh, think about how Isaiah uh, describes the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and his name was what? Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, right? That's his name. These are characteristics of who he is. And that was one long name, very descriptive. So names in the Bible describe something. It describes an entity, it, it, what, what that entity, entity represents. I, I looked it up in the Webster Dictionary. Interesting thing about name, it says someone's reputation. Oh. Isn't that interesting? He's going to make a name for himself, right? What did it say in Philippians 2 about the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, and he made himself of what? No, no reputation. reputation. But yet when you read the Gospels, because of the power of God's word working in him, it says that his fame grew in every region. Here's, a, here's the man, Christ Jesus. He tried to make himself of no name, no reputation, but because of his faith in God and the power of God working through him, everybody knew about it, right. even to this day. <laughs> it's fantastic. I, 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 you want to make a name for yourself? Well, uh, it, it, you, you, it, it also means authority. Stop in the name of the law. So there's all these different things about name, names in the Bible. Notice God changes names. Why do God change names? Um, when, God, when God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, Genesis 11 and 12, what did God change his name to? Abraham, right? Father of many nations. That, that name change to Abraham describes what God, how God sees him as a father of many nations before he even had a child. God changed Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, to Israel means thou has, as a prince, thou has favor with God and men and prevailed, the princes of God. So God changes names throughout the scripture. Throughout scripture, people want to know who God, who God is. When Moses was sent to Israel, what did Moses say? They're going to ask who sent me. They're going to want to know your name. And what did God tell Moses? I am. He says, tell them I am sent you. Well, I, that's not a name. Yes, yeah, a name. I am. I am that I am. Whatever you, I, I'm going to prove myself as, as Jehovah and he, those seven things he reproved in the wilderness and so forth. But he says, I am. I'll fill in the blank. I, I'll be anything you want. I I, I'll be all that you need. That's right. What happened when they came to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of John? They say, are you him? He says, I am. And they <clears throat> fell. <throat> Even before that, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to stone. He was saying, I'm Jehovah God. So the names, these names uh, mean something. God changes names. You know, when, when Samson's parents, I know it's, it's Samuel's parents, when, when they saw the, the angel of God, they wanted to know his name, but he wouldn't tell them. It was a secret. It wasn't time to make that manifest. But when the apostle Paul, when he saw the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, who art thou, Lord? And what was the Lord's answer? I am Jesus. He accomplished his, 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 his name of Jehovah, which is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. So names mean something. Adam named the animals. Adam looked at the characteristic of animals and he named them what God had had in mind. I think about words in the Bible like a fox. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ says, tell Herod that old fox because he was crafty and shifty. Sly. Sly. Uh, they swipe, they steal, you know. 
uh, files of the air. The, the devils, Satan's uh, and, and his and his cohorts are called the files of the air because they steal away God's word like birds steal seed. What's the most famous uh, name for, for Satan? A serpent. Because they're like slimy and there's a serpent beguiled Eve, right? These names are descriptive. But the name of Jesus is the most wonderful name under heaven or in, and in heaven. By the way, I'm going to blow you. Well, maybe I won't. Did you know that God named the Lord Jesus Christ by faith? When God sent the angel to Mary and to Joseph and so forth, he says to, to Mary, thou shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from his sin, from their sins. Before he even accomplished the work of the cross, he was the word in heaven. And his, Jesus is his human, human name, but it describes what he would do. And Paul says that God and the God had made a pact that, that the, the, the son would come and accomplish redemption for man. God would forgive or excuse me, remit sins of the past through the blood sacrifice. There's power in that blood and, and that innocent sacrifice would, would be a propitiation, a temporal one for the sins of those men who offered it. But all that was based upon what Jesus Christ would do at Calvary, right? So God, by faith, says, I trust my son. Paul says, Romans 3, through faith in his blood. Look, look at Romans 3. I want to show you something. Even the name Jesus was one that God gave by faith. God named him. By the way, in the Jewish lore, the, the father, didn't the father, what wasn't the, it was the father who, what? Who uh, named the, the child. That's right. If you remember, on your way to Romans 3, when John the Baptist's father was ready to name his son, but he couldn't speak. And, and, and they were going to give him the name Zechariah. They were going to name him John the Baptist after his father. Remember that? Yeah. But what did the angel say before he, the angel Gabriel say to him before he, he said, he says, name to be John, name him what I said to name him. And so as Zechariah is getting the writing to, he says, John, that was great. I, it was fantastic, right? Yeah. Well, because the he says, no, his name will be John. OK, well, when the angel came to 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 uh, Mary he says, thou shall call his name Jesus for here's why he shall save his people from their sins. And Jesus means salvation. But God named him that before he actually finished the work, he was just he wasn't even conceived yet. And yet God, the father had faith in what his son would do, just like the son had faith that when he died, he would not leave his soul in hell. He wouldn't give Satan the victory to keep him down there. That he would raise, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither shall thy suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Even his own body, or resurrected body. So Christ had faith in the Father's word, the scriptures, and what the Father revealed. But the Father had faith in him, and he named his son, just like with Abraham. He says, Abraham, you don't have any children yet, but you're a father of many nations. Uh, Jacob. I know it hasn't happened yet, but you're going you're gonna to be the prince of God in here in the kingdom. It hasn't happened for, it won't happen for thousands of years, but it's going to happen. Well, with the Lord Jesus, you should, thou should call his name Jesus, for he'll save his people from their sins. And God did that by faith. Notice in Romans, he trusted his son. Look at Romans 3, verse number 24. Being justified freely by his grace, it's the grace of the Father, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a what? Propitiation, a fully satisfying payment through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Paul is saying God was righteous to forbear these people's sins, remit these sins of time past because God knew what was coming. He knew that his son was a faithful son and would accomplish. So it says, through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, he forbeared this, these uh, sins. I mean, these little bulls and goats and calves and stuff of, of, of different species wouldn't be able to take care of man's sins, who made an image and likeness of God. No, you needed a man to come along and do that. And God trusted his son to fulfill that promise. Verse 26, to declare, I say, you don't know this till Paul, by the way, to declare, I say, at this time, that is a dispensational of grace, a dispensational understanding that his righteousness, 
There's the righteousness of God in the law. There's the righteousness of God without the law today. That he might be just, righteous, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So when I say that God named Jesus Christ, names are important. Go back to... I like Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel, no, God no, with us. Yeah. Okay, I got it right here while I was going to ask you about Messiah. Emmanuel. Messiah. Well, you know what? Yeah, that's over in Isaiah, but... Uh, then in the Gospels, it says Emmanuel too. God with, I mean, we could, we could spend a whole series on just the names. Because what a, na a name describes something. It's a word or phrase. Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father. That distinguish and designates a specific person, a place or thing or a group thereof. Some type of entity, what it represents, its reputation, and so forth. Why couldn't the Sadducees know when they said his name is Emmanuel, that he was God with us. Unbelief, lack of, you know what? Lack of studying their Bible. Yeah. A lack of the work of faith, okay? Dorothy, ain't nothing changed. A lack of studying the Bible same is the same thing today, same spirit. Right there, I was going to ask you the same, about the same. One. Good. Well, what, which one is that, Emmanuel? Emmanuel. You can spell it with the E. E or, or I. I. Yeah, exactly. It's just the, the difference whether it's in, in Old Testament or in New Testament, the Hebrew or Greek. So anyway, so names mean something. Names describe. Satan is called a serpent. Herod is called a fox. These things. Adam named those animals looking at the characteristics, okay? But there's nothing more important than the name of Jesus. Now, we're, we, we're, we saw last time, we're going to see today, that there is a chain of command in the overall structure which God has created in, 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 the, in the creation, in the creature. He has all of these positions of rank and authority. There are positions and there are people or beings in the position. People here on earth and other beings, celestial beings that God created in the heavens. But they fill all these positions. Again, the highest ones were thrones. Last time we saw that a throne is the chair or seat of a deity, a royalty, or some type of dignitary. It is the highest in the kingdom. Now there are multiple thrones. God has a throne. Satan has a throne. There are elders that have thrones in the heavens and so forth. The thrones on, on the earth in, in, in Israel's program and so forth. So there's multiple thrones. Um, it is a, it is a, it's, it's, by the way, that same throne, thronos there in, in Colossians is translated to the word seat in Luke 152. In Revelation 2, 13, it's Satan's seat. Uh, Satan had a throne, a seat. Satan had the highest throne in God's creature. He's the one who was the head of the earth, pre-Adam. Pre he was the head of the earth. His goal was to exalt his throne above the stars of God. Let's look at that, okay? Let's look at two passages. Go to Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Because this is important, uh, Satan has the power to delegate authority the way God does. And he has a lot of power throughout uh, the Bible, even to this day. He, he's the chief adversary of God. Uh, Isaiah chapter 14, if you will, and uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. Just, we're just going to look at a few verses. Yeah, Isaiah, and then after Isaiah, you have um, Jeremiah. Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so forth. Ezekiel 28. They're really close to each other. Where are we going first? Let's go to Isaiah 14 first, just to see Satan does have a throne. A very powerful position in, 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 in the, the government of God, both in heaven and earth, by the way. The earth is the central planet. It's the center of all that God's doing in the creature throughout heaven and earth. He, the earth is the center. That's the actual place that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, will, will reside. Uh, God's personage will reside in, in Jesus Christ on this earth one day. Look at Isaiah 14. And verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nation? I can't, I, can't, I can't go past verse 12. You see what says, Lucifer, son of the morning? Right. In, 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 in other versions, NIV. NIV in particular, it calls them uh, uh, the, the bright morning star or something, right? It's something, uh, it, it equates... Lucifer with the Lord Jesus Christ right. in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the Lord Jesus called the bright morning star. Right. 
I believe in the NIV right here in Isaiah 14, 12, yeah, yeah. it calls him the same thing, which I is making him equal with I God. Have arguments on blogs. Yes, on but, it, but, it's, but it's in it. Exactly, Matthew. Yeah. So, son of the morning. Son of, not the bright and morning star. Exactly. How art thou cut to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? So what we see is a prophecy about Satan, okay? He's going to look at what he did and what he said, and then his end. Verse 13. For thou hast, past tense, said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now, Satan's throne was on this earth, but he, did, he wanted to be the most high possessor of heaven and earth, okay? I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my, what? Throne above the stars of God. The stars of God, he's not talking about the stars that we see out there in the cosmos. He's talking about the angelic uh, rulers, the angelic and the angels. Number three. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Now that, that's the place where God has these councils where he holds these beings accountable. He has been doing it. If you want to get a, a view of that, you can see it in Job chapter 1, verse 5, and Job chapter 2, verse 1. Okay? Verse number 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Now there's all these stories in heavens. He's going to go to the height. Basically, he's saying what Paul says about the Lord Jesus, that the Lord was, was, he, he was taken up far above all heavens, right? Satan says, I'm going to sit where God the Father sits. That's his yeah, point. That's right. Verse 14, I will ascend upon, up above the heights of the clouds, and here's the conclusion. His, this is his whole goal. I will be like the Most High. Sure. Genesis 14, verse 19, the Most High God is possessor of heaven and earth. And in verse 15, I'm just going to give you the, the Cliff Notes version. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pits. Christ, he, he, he created hell for the, for, for the devil and his angels. And in that kingdom, when the Lord comes to set it up, that's where Satan's going until he's going to get judged at the great white throne. And we'll be there to help the Lord judge him. Okay? But the fact is, he has a throne. So there's all of this chain of commands, both these positions and, and, pe and persons, whether it's people in the earth, and these other beings, celestial beings, heavenly beings, like Satan and so forth. Go to Ezekiel 28 now. Let's see some more about, about uh, Satan. Now, Satan's seat on the earth will be in Babylon in the future. Okay? So that's about Revelation. That's, there, will be an actual, there will be an actual literal seat. When I say his seat, he's going to have a human being in charge. But the fact is, it'll be Satan's seat, okay? It's called the throne of iniquity in the book of Psalms. We might get to it. All right, look with me, if you will, at Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. Ezekiel, start at verse 11. Now, he's going to do this uh, lamentation to a man, but the man is actually ruled by, the flesh and blood is ruled by satanic power. And, and he's going to talk about, about the, the, the satanic power behind him. Verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, that's Ezekiel saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him. So in history, this king of Tyrus uh, was, was symbolic of both Satan and, and obviously the Antichrist, but just keep reading. Thus saith the Lord God, thou, now watch this, thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now right off the bat, you say, hmm, interesting terms. It's hard for that to, to be talking about a human, a flesh and blood. Verse 13, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. And then he goes through all of these stones. Verse 14, we know who it is. Thou art the anointed, that's a Christ. That's thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mount, mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Lucifer is a created being till Nicholas was found in thee. Till. Till. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and so forth. Um, it's so much. Thou hast sinned, therefore I will, I will cast thee out of profane, out of the mount of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst. Verse 17. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness, so forth. This is a description of Lucifer when he was in the, heaven, the heavenly uh, uh, council of Almighty God. God would, he would take all of his creatures, 
his, 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 his rulers, his leaders of all of his planets and so forth, and bring them to council. Well, Lucifer had that high, he had high authority in that council. Just iniquity, it's iniquity itself, right? It's not like there was iniquity was around and oh, no. what happened to be found in him. This is the inception of This is the inception of it, right. Iniquity. This is the beginning of iniquity. Yeah, and, and we're no, not, notice also, uh, thou hast sinned in verse 16. Most people are confused when, when Paul says in Romans 5, for by one man sin entered the world. It says, by one man sin entered the world. But sin was in existence before Adam. Exactly. The, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Evil existed. Iniquity. Sin existed because it was pre-Adamic. It, 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 the inception was with Lucifer. Yeah. And, and the reason he did, he got puffed up in pride. With pride, Paul says. And he, he was so beautiful. But the one thing I want you to see was his wisdom. Notice in verse 17, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast, cor thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. Uh, his brightness, his glory is what he's talking about. He was so glorious. Here's what I want you to see in verse 15 about the wisdom. Because this is going to come back. Thou was perfect in thy ways. No, wait a minute. Where's the wisdom at? Oh, verse 12. Son of man, take up. Okay, verse 12. Thou sealest up the sum. Um, how do I explain that? What we're going to see is all of these, these positions of delegated authority, right? It just goes down, 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 down. It's an actual pyramid is what it is, quite frankly. And it's just this delegated authority down. Well, Lucifer is up there. Then you have God, okay? And he fills up the sum. If you add it all up, it, it went to him. The only person who was greater was God in the throne. We saw that like with, with Joseph, with Pharaoh, right? The only one greater in authority in the, in the pre-Adamic uh, world was, uh, was God, the only, the only one um, who had more authority than Lucifer. And Lucifer, he could affect all those beings under him. There, were no, there was no other created being uh, over Lucifer, okay? When he says, thou sealest up the sum, just like at the, uh, it, it's, it's a lot there I can't even get into right now. You know, that, that all C&I and all that, kind of that thing, that, that New World Order and all that. Thou seal us up the sun. Yeah, all that stuff. It's, it's all satanic. It's Satan worship is what it is. Right in the back of it. It's all Satan worship. He wants to be like the Most High. He want to he wanna fill that up. He seal us up the sun. Notice it says, thou seal us up the sun, full of wisdom. That's a lot of pride. Oh, well, it, it could be. First, it was a lot of wisdom. It was a lot of wisdom. Now, now he, by the way, he didn't lose his wisdom. It's corrupted. By the way, full of wisdom. That means full of wisdom. The only one who had more wisdom than Lucifer was God himself. That's right. God stacked him with wisdom. The spirit of wisdom filled him up. Exactly. But, you know, he God is God now. I can't give you everything. <laughs> Well, plus this is God full is, of wisdom from one who was created. From a created That's being. The That's the difference. God, exactly. God's infinite. God is right. infinite. Right. Exactly. And part of God's infinite wisdom, he just kept a secret. Right. Called the mystery of Christ. And he now yes. reveals it to us. Now, Satan in his wisdom said, I'm going to keep it secret from you all, you human beings. Well, he can't keep a secret from all of us. We now know from Paul. And if you, if you listen to Paul, you'll know it. Okay. Right. But can I tell you something that would happen to him? Pride. Mm -hmm. And what, what pride does... It, it starts to corrupt this, and, and he's wise, but it's a corrupted, delusional wisdom now. Right. He, he's doing everything. He's destroying himself. At, at every turn, God is catching him in his own craftiness, and nothing was more greater than the cross. Like 1 Corinthians 2. For, for if, if none of the princes of this world knew, the princes of Satan and his angelic beings would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have let Jesus Christ have the earth, but they would have had the rest of I'm going to give y'all some crazy next time because I've been thinking about, sometimes people ask me, say, Ron, what would have happened had Satan not crucified the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, there's a number of things about how he still had to die, but the question would be like, if the cross didn't happen, how would God have reconciled the heavenly places? I can't be thinking about that on a different thing. I'll bring it up another time, but uh, maybe next week or during the Q&A. I got, got some thoughts on that because... God could still, I'm starting to see how he, how he could have accomplished, he got a billion, two ways he could do it. He, one of the ways that as I could think it through, he could have accomplished that even without that. But, you know, it, that, it, it didn't happen. The cross happened, so we just content with that. But there's ways that God could have done. Uh, Satan had free will. 
the, the people who crucified the Lord, they all have free will. God knew what would happen because he's God. He wrote it down, but he didn't cause it. Israel could have just as soon, I mean, he presented himself as the Messiah, the Lamb, all those three and a half years, those four days he was in Jerusalem before he died, the Passover, all that, they should have taken him. He, he healed that leper, he says, go and offer the sacrifice, which the Moses commandment, uh, Mo Moses commanded to show the priest, the priest should have said, who cleansed you of this leprosy? It's the Messiah, oh, our Messiah. We talked about on, on, on Sunday, the psalm that they sang at the Last Supper. Was it, it one 118, uh, blessed is he to come in the name of the Lord. We've heard, we've, we praise you now, the temple of the Lord. Bind the, the sacrifice to the horns of the altar. Israel was rehearsing that for 1,500 years. They were singing that at the time. They should have taken him. He gave them proof. He says, testify to the priest, all that. So he still would have died. Yeah. But all of that was according to prophecy. So he would have gotten the earth. So I got some thoughts about the heavenly places, but we'll just remind me. We'll probably talk about that in Q&A or uh, another time. So here, Lucifer fills up the sun, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. This full of wisdom, like Matthew just said, of all the created beings, the creature, there's no one who, has more, who had nor has more wisdom than Lucifer. Now, we have access to God's wisdom, and we will have it. Post-rapture, we're going to be learning it throughout, okay? That's the difference. We're going to learn it. By the way, um, Lucifer and all the angelic beings would have been learning God's wisdom throughout. Had, you know, had they just been patient, they would have learned his wisdom. Satan got filled with pride and, and not knowing his wisdom compared to God's wisdom is like a speck. Okay, God has infinite wisdom. And he was willing to teach his his sons. The, a son is a direct creation. So these guys were his sons. All these angelic beings are called the sons of God. Okay? So he was more than willing, God was more than willing to teach them over the course of time. That was the problem with Adam. So Adam the, the body of Christ members are sons because they're part of an agency that's a direct, direct creation. Direct creation of God. Yep. Exactly. Whether it's the angels, whether it's Israel, whether it's Christ, whether it's the body of Christ. Exactly. And so... What we want to do is have our father's wisdom. Well, Adam, where they went wrong is they tried to have wisdom. Ye shall be wise. No, God doesn't know in the day that you eat your, your eyes shall be open. It was a tree of desire to make one wise. They tried to have a shortcut to get what God was willing to give them. God was teaching them his own wisdom daily through those studies. The Lord would meet with them and teach them about the earth about his plan and purpose to redeem the earth and subdue the earth from satanic rebellion. And if they would have been patient, you know Paul says to endure sound doctrine? Because it is a process that God is not in a hurry. He wants you to learn. People go to school. You, isn't that true? From the time you're four years old, they put you in preschool. <laughs> and then higher learning, you go, 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 go. You know, bachelor's, BA, bachelor's degree, all these things. Uh, master's degree, then uh, all these PhD. Oh, you, mankind is in school. And it's a trip. You watch somebody, they, they just go all the way through, right? And they never break from four years old to like 40 or something. What is in that? That's a constant learning, higher learning. And that's what God, the right learning, the word of God, he wants to do that with mankind. He wants to teach you his wisdom. Through his curriculum. Through his curriculum. Not man's curriculum. Exactly. The Messiah is going to teach in the kingdom. It says that. It, he's going to, the Messiah is going to teach in the kingdom. He's going to teach his guys and they're going to teach others. You know, my personal opinion is that the Apostle Paul will be the lead teacher. I mean, he calls himself the teacher, the preacher of the gym. I don't think that ever going to change. He's going to teach the, you know, the rest of us joiners and so forth. And we teach our brethren. That's just kind of what I'm thinking. But the point is, we're going to learn our Father's wisdom. By the way, the angels don't have all wisdom. They don't know everything. They're learning from us, the mystery. Right, right. They learn. They, they, they learn what's going on. They're learning as they go. Mm -hmm. Satan had to learn the mystery. He had guys on Paul, we're going to see. He had, he had his forces. By the way, he himself, sometimes, when it's, because he's up here, he got all this delegated authority. <laughs> Can I tell you all something? And the funny thing, I come in the black community with the uh, black church, Satan is always busy, they say, right? Satan is on it. Satan ain't worried about folk. Satan worried about people who know this message. Exactly. Okay? The satanic attack coming, if you're faithful to Paul, 
that religious system, he got that thing. It's, he wasn't worried about these Gentile heathens down here, and he's not worried about religious heathens. So, so autopilot. <laughs> oh, Satan been busy, brother. No, he, well, yes, but not with you. You already taken captive. No, no, no. Satan, he's looking for members of the body, real safe people who know the mystery, who stand for the mystery, who are faithful like we are. This is what he takes. He takes notice of the, what we're doing here. Because we follow Paul, we stand for these mystery truths, especially these things that glorify the Lord, like this resurgent truth of the judgment seat and joining it. Like our ancient adversary takes notice of that. And there are times when the great ancient enemy says, I need to come down, forget all these guys, I got to do them. You know, there's sometimes we're going to see like with the thrones, the president, we don't have, we have a republic here. We don't have a kingdom set up, but... The people in Corinth, excuse me, the people here in, in Ephesus knew, in Colossians knew, in Philippi, in the Roman Empire, they, they, they understood these issues of kingdoms and so forth in the Old Testament. And vice president, we're going to see some things like uh, vice president, some equivalents. But, but sometimes the president can send the vice president to, 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 to do, take care of something. Sometimes he can send the secretary of state. You know, he could send other people. But sometimes there are times where President Obama has to get in his airplane and fly over to do, and take care of business. He needs to be here himself because it's, it's that important. There's sometimes when this man, when this creature, Lucifer, says, I, uh, no, I can't. He'll, 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 he'll work on the lower levels. But as, as, as things get more pressure filled, he gets he says, I got to do it myself. We're going to see that. He went to he went to Eve himself. Mm -hmm. He went to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, didn't he? We're going to see some verses through time where he's the one who went. There, there are plenty of devils in Israel. Christ was casting out devils. They're like the low end of the, the spectrum. Those disembodied spirits from pre adamic and these giants and so forth from, from Genesis 6. But Lucifer says, I'm doing it myself. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you something. All the hordes of the full of the darkness were there at, at Calvary when Christ was on that cross and that and that spiritual darkness that I mean that physical darkness that you could feel type of that when, when God brought them out of Egypt Satan and all his cohorts they were there with, with the with trying to get them trying to get them in the middle of the day just dark that wasn't just an anomaly that was spiritual wickedness all the hordes of Satan there trying to get that them. was the shadow of death yes and you know what? Study on that. It's the faith of Jesus Christ, trust in his father that says, you won't let him get me, father. Yeah, if you read Hosea 5, it really connects it. All right, we'll, we'll check that out during the Q&A. We'll, we'll do it. But that's what I'm saying. So the Lord had to trust his father, right? As the father trusts his son to continue on. He it, recognized those. He recognized that darkness. Oh, sure. He could see. Dorothy, where the Lord Jesus Christ was different from any human being is he could, he could see those things. He could, Ryan and I were talking about different dimensions, how you could, the Lord could read thoughts. He could do things that mankind should have been able to do. No, he could do things that mankind did before the fall. Tell, he could read minds, he could read hearts. He knew, he, Nathaniel. He knew Nathaniel. He knew Nathaniel, I knew he, By the way, he didn't have to see a, a devil in people. He just walked up to the guy and says, what's your name? He wasn't talking to the man, he was talking to the devil. Because the devil says, my name is Legion, for we are many. He even asked his name. By the way, the fact that he asked that name, the guy's name was Legion, for we are many. That that was that the devil was was letting him know his his position right. out here in the satanic hordes. Like here we are, right here, or whatever. Well, since it was devils, they were here, but they were powerful because it was many of them, right? Mm -hmm. The Lord could see that. Now we can't see it, but He could, and He 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 operated the way Adam could have operated. Adam and Eve saw Lucifer. They saw the other angels of God, both fallen and the, 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 the holy angels. They could see in the spirit world. <laughs> it, that's what's crazy about the temptation. God doesn't know that your eyes shall be open. They already had their spiritual eyes open. It was closed after the fall. <laughs> they could see this stuff. He sold them. He merchandised them a bill of goods, a lemon. It's just like him. Just, just like them, a snake in the grass. You know that term, snake in the grass? That comes from that. Lucifer. For on your belly shall thou go, right? And dust shall eat. That's, that's satanic. 
And to this day, certain salesmen use those tactics, don't they? Little snaky, sneaky tactics. Well, let me tell you something. Full of wisdom. And so of all of the created beings, Lucifer is up there. It says, thou art wiser than Daniel. So here's what we're going to see as we go through this study. When God, what God is looking for is some wise beings, some people who operate in his wisdom. See, although Satan is wise, he does not operate in godly wisdom. It's darkness. It's the wisdom of darkness. God is looking for some wise or some people who, who, who operate in the spirit of wisdom. Is uh, that what learning the word is all about? That's, that's right. Discernment, um, judgment. See, Dorothy, when, when, when Paul says the eyes of your understanding being lightened and so forth, he, saw, he talks about wisdom and prudence. What we're going to see uh, about these rulerships, it was based on righteousness and judgment. Judgments and righteousness, right? Um, let's look at a couple more with the uh, issue of the thrones and we move to dominions. Look at Psalm. Go to Psalm 97. Psalm 97. Psalm 97. And uh, these thrones are made for wise judgment. All right, here we go. Man. All right, here we go. Look at Psalm 97, verse 2. Oh, look at verse 1. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. This is a, a, pro, a messianic prophecy in the kingdom. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness. So this is the kingdom, okay? Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and what? Judgment. judgment. So those two things, righteousness and judgment, are the habitation of his throne. throne. So his throne will operate. It is that way now, but it's in the heavens. When he comes down, when the Lord Jesus Christ sets up his throne, righteousness, he's always going to do what's right, righteousness, and he's going to judge, uh, judge uh, judgment, okay? Discern, he's going to make right judgments. So that's what ultimately God is looking for. He wants some beings who, right, who, who are qualified to make right judgments on his behalf. Go to Proverbs. Oh, real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. You notice a lot of people always think God is love, but those are the key things he is in the throne. I mean, oh, yeah. he has a lot of attributes. Love is one of them, but it's not the only right, attribute. Right, right. When, when John says God is love, he's dealing with John, dealing with God's attitude towards that little flock in Israel. Exactly. But God is more than love. Yes. God is just yeah, and, and holy. He's these things. Right? Yes. And other many attributes. That's because why we fear him. That's right. Right. We fear God. That's right. Oh, I looked up fear and trembling. Paul. <laughs> Paul talks about it. He says to the Corinthians. When I sent Titus, you guys received him with fear and trembling because Titus was God's man, Paul's uh, God's man through Paul, right? Mm -hmm. Fear and trembling. He tells us in Philippians, he tells the saints, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you don't start with fear and trembling mm -hmm. at the word of God, you're not going to get where God wants you to get. That's right. So Jesus Christ, our Lord, is going to rule with a rod of iron, but that rod of iron would be righteous judgment. Thank you for that, Matthew. Look at Proverbs chapter 16, if you will. Look at Proverbs 16, verse 12. It is an abomination. Okay? Now, abomination. It is an abomination to kings to commit wickedness. For the throne is established how? By righteousness. So when God creates thrones... He's looking for a righteous judgment, right? Now, let me, let me, let me share that with why Paul brings this up in Colossians. Colossians is our devotion to him. Righteousness is, is equivalent to God's glory. That's, he he's looking for that, that, that issue that, just, that, that equals, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. You could just say, for all of sin and come short of the righteousness of God, the perfect righteousness, right? Romans 3. So as you... Here's your account. Here's your account up there. As you bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which, is, which are by Jesus Christ, through the work of faith, the labor of love, the patience of hope, the suffering, it's fruit that's abounding to your account. Now, it, you're going to receive for the evil you've done, too, down here. That's abounding. And so, so that's why when Paul, when those guys wouldn't stand with Paul, he says, Ooh, I pray God that it's not laid to their charge. Yeah. It's a charge account. 
And what he's saying is all these things that happen now, they're either building up a count of righteousness or, or, or you building up, you know, it's stuff to, to take away from it. Uh, loss. Yeah, exactly. And Paul says, Paul understood there's, there's a weight of glory. There's weights and balances. In fact, right, right in Proverbs 16, 11, yeah, a weight just and weight and balance yeah. are the Lord. <laughs> Paul says a more exceeding eternal weight of glory. So here's what I'm seeing when Paul says that. When he says, I pray God is not laid to their charge. Paul, Paul understood that their labor, your suffering could be in vain and your labor could be in vain. And Paul says, these are some guys who had been uh, fruit abounded to their account. But because of their attitude towards the apostle, to the end, at the end, just because they didn't stand with him, if he understood that if Christ, the avenger, the terror of the Lord, if, 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 if that was laid to their charge account at the judgment seat of Christ, it could, it could have or could nullify or, you know, what's the word? nullify or um, this could have been so great that it could have made them lose reward, even though they had spent time building it up. It's like if you have a million dollars in an account and you charge nine hundred thousand nine nine nine, you got a, a dollar left. <laughs> that dollar ain't going to be good enough. Right. To pay the next bill. So Paul was like, oh, Lord, don't do that, because he understood the importance of be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, Paul. You need both of them. And I don't care, like the guys in Philippians who were preaching a mystery, yet they weren't giving Paul his due. They were, they were, they were contentious. They were supposing to add affliction to his bonds, Philippians 1. Christ is just laying that to their charge. They're going to be like, Lord, we, we, I don't want to hear it. You were, you, were, you, were, you were attacking my man. It's kind of like how you know, mm -hmm. people preach a false Jesus name. Oh. But it's like they preach a, Paul, a false Paul. It's yes. Like Paul is not significant. It's yeah. Like, yeah. That's not the Paul. The, the yeah. Reality. They'll say, well, Paul, yeah, yeah, he's an apostle, but really, he's just like the rest of them. There's nothing special about him. Yeah, that's a different Paul. That's not the Paul that's that does. Right? Exactly. Said. That's and not what Jesus said. He is my chosen vessel right. to bear my name. Right. My name. Right. He is a, okay. So you see these thrones. A couple uh, more with these thrones. Look at Job chapter 36. You're in Proverbs. Just go back. Psalm Job chapter 36. Job. I mean, you guys. Job. 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 I was a guy in the hood who called it Job. <laughs> <laughs> he got up. You, mom, you remember? Uh, you remember Lewis? Oh, oh yeah. nice little Lewis. Yeah. He got up there. He go to. He said, "Go to Job chapter." <laughs> now you said that in a black church. You, know, you got a job, man. You got a job for me, you know. <laughs> And we was like, no, it's Job. Spell like Job, but it's Job. 30, Job 36. That's just funny. Job 36. I, I, I know. It was a very sweet guy. Job 36. That's the worst part about ministry. You know, you got to go on and do ministry. I had to come to Minnesota. I got to come here. But you, you miss the people. You miss the saints that you've grown with. Sure. Yeah. And, and that's why we're going to see each other in a glorious reunion. You know? Yeah. Amen. Uh, Job chapter 36. Verse 7, he withdraweth not his eyes from the righteous. Now watch this. God is always watching the righteous. Now watch this. But with kings are they on the throne. Yea, he doth establish them forever, and they are exalted. So I know I went there. What God is looking for are some righteous people. Okay. Now you say, Brother Ron, I had somebody just email and said, Dear Sister Lord, she said she's just learning, she's growing. Uh, because of this doctrine, she's come along to see it with her husband. She says, uh, 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 it was not, well, it was two of them actually, but one lady was like, one sister was like, we, we are righteous in Christ when we trust his shed blood. I said, yes, that is our initial righteousness for our justification, salvation, as it were. Yes, that, that first by faith in his blood, right? So that's a, 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 a by faith. That's a positional through, through faith, through the faith faith of Christ. Okay. Okay. That's a positional thing. But then there's the, so there's your position, but then there's the practice, right? Faith of Christ and your sanctification. And, your sanctification. and, and that's how you understand Paul's epistles. You have to rightly divide justification, sanctification. So there's that, that uh, book in by faith. This is how we walk. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. We have access to that through the faith of Christ. Right. And we have that access. That's Romans five, verse one and two. Uh, therefore being justified Therefore, being justified by faith, right, 
we have peace with God. So there's our initial justification. We have justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, right? By whom also we have access. See, not everybody uses that access. Right. If somebody gives you a million dollars and you need some money to pay your rent, and I say, there's a million dollars in an account. Well, you can't just sit there and be crying. You got to go and access the account, pay the bill. Access by faith. Second. And there's our, you know, we, we have access to this by faith into this grace wherein we stand, you know, we're sta okay? So there's position and then there's practical. And she got it. And that's what I'm saying. So this, this issue is uh, justification and sanctification. And the end result, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Glory. And, and, and I know people are going to think I'm nuts, but when he says rejoice in the hope of the, we're going to do that, glory of God, right. okay? Right. His glory. Right. Thought it, together. Yes, yeah. thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And when you make yourself of no reputation, when I when I show you about these these positions, but also the creatures, God is looking for some humble. We gonna get no rep, and then he'll. You know what? God wants to give you a name. Mankind down here want to make a name for himself. No, make yourself of no reputation and God will give you a name. That's the good one. That's the good one. Let God name you, right? Yes, yes. And it's not just Christ, your, your justification, your by faith positional. Uh, God is looking for some fruits of righteousness. Look at that verse again in Job 36, verse 7. He withdraweth not his eyes from the who? Right. Righteous. Remember it says, the Lord looketh down upon the earth, seeing does anyone have faith? Yeah. He, he, he finds righteous people and says, those are my people. Yes. Now that's Israel, but now he's in the body too. And he's looking for people bringing forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So that he can put us, exalt us. Verse 7, he withdraws not his eyes from the righteous, but with kings, people on thrones. Are they on the throne? Yea, he doth establish them forever. So God is looking for some righteous people to put in some positions of authority where they reign with him and for him. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. Now, we saw Satan's throne. God is looking for righteous judgment. He's, he wants some people who have righteous judgment as their trademark. And I think about Paul says, I press toward that mark of the prize of the high calling of God. He wants living symbols of his justice and righteousness. And can I tell you, we talk about, I just talked to Matthew, we talk about it all the time, just yesterday on the phone, a, uh, Matthew here, a son. We talk about, you hear about sonship, son, what it means to be a son. Now we're all sons by faith in Christ Jesus, Galatians 4. But there are some who actually operate and walk in that. That's the difference between a justified son and a sanctified son. The first by faith, son by faith, and one who walks by faith, okay? You can have sons. I mean, you can have the prodigal son. God, that was my son. He out there with the, pig, with the pigs. And I got a son, you know. So you can, people understand that. God is looking for some faithful sons. And a son, let me tell you what the definition of a son is. This is what, you just boils down to this. Why do people have children? Why did, why did the Jews have sons? So they can operate the father's business. What if the Lord said at 12, he says to his mother and Joseph, the other version says your mother and father. Jesus. King James says your, 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 Joseph and his mother keeps his integrity as the son of God and not a, a human from Joseph. Anyway, it says at 12, he says, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? And a son is created to make righteous judgments on his father's behalf. He said that at 12 years old. At 12 years old. At 12 that's, is obviously. That's the, that's the bar mitzvah age, huh? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you teach your children, you know it's interesting, bar mitzvah age. like home, like homeschooling and stuff, right? You, you, can, you can accelerate your, your child's understanding if you're their teacher. Yes. Because a 12 year old in that Jewish culture was able to operate as an adult. Bar, bar, uh, yep, a man. Exactly a time appointed of the father, it says. Mm -hmm. I always tell you about uh, Burt Reynolds. 
that old that that that, that actor with the mustache, he was a band's man, and somebody interviewed him, says, Bert, when did you know you were a man? Was it 18? Was it 21? He says, no, when my father told me I was a man. He says, that was when I was a man. For him, it was like 24 or something. But in the Jewish culture, because of the law and the prophets, for the word of God, you can accelerate the wisdom of your child. Now, 12-year-old in our culture, that's a baby. They're sixth grade. But if you homeschool a 12 year old, your 12 year old can be as smart as a 21 year old, you know, as far as wisdom. That's right. Okay. I've so that. you've experienced that. Daughters, yeah. My daughters. Yeah. And they have bat mitzvahs. They had bar mitzvahs, son of the father, and bat mitzvahs, uh, daughter. So anyway, that's what you have there. And so you can, God, he's, he's creating sons that do the father's business. Oh, Les Feldick, he has a wonderful testimony, Brother Les, how when he went over to Jerusalem, they take trips over there. He says he would every year he'd go into this uh, this this shop, this this shop, this uh, souvenir shop. It was an old Jewish man, and he and he noticed he had a little little five year old son. <laughs> so every year the people would go there and they see that son grow up and up and up. But but less than the guys would deal with the father. So one year they went in there, if I'm not mistaken, and and his son was 12 years old. So over the course of about seven years. The father's in the back there taking care of some business. Les goes in and says, hey, hey, you little guy, you know, you remember him? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's like, well, we want to get some stuff. Where's your father? He says, no, uh, uh, dad put me in charge of the store. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> and so now Les is like, oh, and I start, he says, start to negotiate because the Jews, they like to negotiate and stuff. So he says, the father's back there, can hear what's going on, they just wave to Les, hey, you know. But he let his son do the negotiating because he trusted his son. And, 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 and when Les asked the man, says, hey, you know, I noticed your son started doing it. He goes, yes, because my son has been watching. He's been sitting there. You guys saw him as a little boy. He's watching, watching. He's been doing that his whole life. He now can think the way I do about these things. That's what he wants us to do. Yes. 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 Think and act and labor. Yep. To so think, to act, and labor with the father. Yeah. That's what he's looking for. Yep. Now, you think that father would have been comfortable if one of his knucklehead boys would have not been there and just said, you know, come in. Hey, Dad, I'm going to take over the business. Let me, let me operate the business. He says, you don't even know, you don't even know the business. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that most saints in the body of Christ don't even know our father's business? They have no clue what he's doing today. That's right. None. They don't know what he's doing. They still over here. In the old they, are back. they don't even know. <laughs> How foolish that would be for our wise father to say, okay, you're in charge of my... They're not qualified. Not qualified. Exactly right. Because that father would disqualify that son. He would disqualify. And guess where that disqualification comes? At the judgment seat of Christ. Right. Because Jesus Christ is able with the mind of his father to sit and make judgments on his father's behalf. Right. This is the judgment seat of Christ because first is the judgment of God for the believers. And God trusts his son, Jesus Christ, so much that God the Father is going to be off running some things. And he's going to say, son, he's going to... Here's going to be God the Father back here, and here's the Son, the Lord Jesus, handling the business. He trusts his Son to be able to take all of us and give us exactly what he knows the Father would give us himself. Because the Father, when we're presented to the Father, the body of Christ, he's not going to say, uh, Son, how'd you let this guy get up here? <laughs> he's going to say, Son, just like he did with Adam, whatever the name thereof, that was the name thereof. And every position is going to be filled by a member of the body of Christ, the thrones, the millions, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, and every name is a name. And whatever Jesus Christ gives us as individuals in the body, the Father says, that's right, son. You did perfectly. Because that's what they qualify for. Included. And women are included, yes. Dorothy, you ladies who are faithful, and you ladies who watch by way of in, you ladies who are faithful in this truth, that distinction in Christ goes away. God is respectful yes. of person. Oh, yeah. No oh, yeah. Right. The, those, those positions of authority operate in human relationships, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. husband, wife, so forth. But once that takes place, in Christ Jesus, there's neither uh, male nor female, bond nor free. Right. All that stuff, out of there, Paul said. So he's looking for that. Um, we're coming down to the end. Let me just put this out on there. I thought we were going to get to dominions today. We start dominions next week. A son was created to make righteous judgments on his father's behalf, his father's business. But here's the point I want you to get. A son has to be humble, have 
no pride or ambition of his own. All he wants to do is be about his father's business. That's you. Well, that's, that's all of us. That's you. Well, thank you, Dorothy. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's thank you. Because you. that's my desire. I wait. That's, that's right. my. That's right. All right. So we're going to end in a verse in John. But before we do, the angels of God. Remember I said they're direct creations of God. They're, they're called the sons of God in the Old Testament there. The angels of God. Did you know that the angels of God came up with the law? When we talk about the law of God or the law of Moses, those Ten Commandments were, they came based upon the counsel of the sons of God, the heavenly sons of God. They came up with that law. They did it. According to Psalm 68, verse 17, Acts 7, 53, uh, Stephen says, who received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When you dispose someone, you, you, they verb. Um, Paul, our apostle said in Galatians 3.19 it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator Moses and what you see is God using his sons to make judgments and that's why the law is called judgments now the same thing is going to happen at the great white throne judgment God is going to use the body of Christ to help him judge out there now a brother in the Lord asked me I didn't get back to him I get questions each day over the internet he says brother Ron you said in a study that we're going to constantly be learning the Word of God, the eternal Word of God. And it's true. We want to be learning, all of us. The joint heirs who already know what our Father's doing will teach our brethren the majority of the 99% of the body of Christ that don't have a clue what God's doing. We're going to teach them. That's what I think we're going to do for the thousand years as Jesus Christ and Israel reigns down here. We're going to prepare our minds and the minds of our brethren, and Paul's going to, all of us together, to be at the judgment seat of Christ. First Corinthians 6, we shall judge the world, we shall judge angels. Okay. His question was, since we're going to be growing in understanding of the mystery and what our Father has for all eternity, we're going to understand these things more fully without the flesh. Can you then get a higher position out there? In other words, after the rapture, after we get out there, and because we're going to be learning, can you now, let's say if you didn't know these things now, or didn't believe these things, can you then, because you're going to want, but his point was, everybody in the body of Christ will know what we all know now. We all, everybody's going to know it then, after the judgment seat, or during the judgment seat, because that's what we're going to be judged on. I, I tell people all the time, you got to study Paul's epistles when he takes you to the other ones, go there, but understand, what you're going to be judged on is your understanding of the mystery of Christ, what Paul writes. Get that first. So, let's say you don't get it now. You suffer loss at the judgment seat. You're every name that is named. But you're going to learn all the stuff. He's not going to keep you ignorant forever. He loves you. He's going to teach you. You're not going to have flesh to reject it, right? That's right. Now, the brother's question was, so can people gain in their position? Can they be promoted, as it were, after the rapture? The answer is no. No. There won't be any. Well, yeah. competition. Right. Well, it won't be in competition, but all the positions at the rapture, God will have all the members of the body of Christ that He needs to fill everything you know, that He has, and you and you earn and you qualify yourself now. That, that would be like applying purgatory to Christianity. Yes, yeah, like an opposite purgatory. In, a sense, in an opposite way. Opposite way. Like anti purgatory. I should have said. Yes, yeah, something uh, crazy uh, like that. Ah, uh, uh, purgatory. Uh, purgatory. <laughs> but but here's the point. You. You gain, you, you gain now, you, um, you determine what reward you're going to get, what position you're going to get now. Once the rapture takes place, it's over. Well, for, for, for most people, once they die, it's over. Right. But actually, the rapture, obviously, is going to end the dispensation of grace. So there's going to be a group of uh, us who don't die. And we're all going to go here. So you, where you're going to spend eternity in, as far as your position, whether it's thrones, dominions, principality, powers, mights, whatever, or every name that's name, that's determined by your walk of faith right now. Even though you're going to learn about all of God's plan and purpose forever, once the rapture takes place or your death, you cannot advance anymore. You'll advance in understanding, but you won't advance in position. That's required right now by faith. That's why this is so important. That's, that's why right. he that's says, right. keep going. Yes, press. That's, right. that's, that's exactly what the judgment seat of Christ... That's why it's a race. That's, it's a race. We're not racing in heaven. We're in heaven. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you can't walk by faith once the rapture happens or yeah. when you die because 
You're going to see the Lord. Hey, Lord. Faith will be sight. Yes. I can't wait. Amen. But right now, so right now, redeem the time. If, if, if you've been running behind in this race and you're hearing this, you now, do our, we can help you at our ministry and you read Paul's business. We can help you. We can help you redeem that time. You know, in a race, I've seen runners. You ever seen runners run a race? And sometimes they get a, a late start. But when, if they real fast, they can catch up with the competition. Well, you can do that spiritually if you right. start believing these things. And the judgment seat of Christ and the terror of the Lord and the fear of trembling, all that stuff accelerates this. So let's end. So a son was created to make righteous judgment on behalf of his father. No, no, they want, you're looking for humility, no pride, no ambition of your own to exalt your father. The angels came up with the law. Uh, 1 Kings 22, God uses his angels, his sons in the heavens to make decisions on, on the earth. And we're going to see how these decisions made up here filter down throughout the thing. Okay, God would send like an angel like uh, uh, Gabriel, but he has to go through all these things just to get down there. And what it is, it filters down. But like and what we're going to see next time, like with Moses, when Moses had those 70... They were, they were over tens, fifties, hundreds of, of Israel, you know, these, these guys. And, and then like Moses was at the top. So the more judgment needed, the more wisdom needed, the higher you had to go, right? Moses was the ultimate authority. He, got, he, was, the, he, was, God, he, was, he got the wisdom of God. So you can make these little judgments down here, same in that realm. But as things got tougher and needed more righteous judgment, you had to go up the chain. Now, in the darkness, Lucifer is up top there. In, in light, Christ, Christ is, our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And then he's going he's gonna to redo all this. He's going to get them out of there and put his own right. But my point is, that's what it is. And, and a son is supposed to make righteous judgment on behalf of his fathers. The angels came up with the law, Psalm 68, 17, Acts 7, 53, Galatians 3, 9. Let's look at one verse as we end. Go to John chapter 5. Uh, God created both Adam and the... Second Adam, the last, uh, the last Adam, second man, last the last Adam, that shows you his humanity, to, 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 ju to judge on his behalf. Look at, uh, let's end in John chapter number five. It might be familiar to most of you all, but let's look at it. John five, look what the Lord said about his ministry to Israel for us. Uh, verse 27, we'll just look at one first. John five twenty-seven. You know, you know what? Uh, verse 26 and 27, let's get the context. For as the Father hath life in himself, this is right, God is life, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. You see that? God delegates that authority. Verse 27, and hath given him authority to execute what? Judgment, Judgment also. Why? Because he is the Son of Man. And because of his humanity, okay, that's what God created Adam to do. Adam right. fell, right. so God he got the last Adam. Yep. This one succeeded, and so all power is given to him. Yep. If, if I could just say it's just like that old man in, in Israel sitting in the back there says, son, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Now what we're going to see next time or in this study is Jesus Christ, he reigns for only a time. Isn't that interesting? For a time. You didn't know that, did you? Thought it was forever. Krista asked a question last time. She says, what's going to happen after the great white throne judgment? Let's say it's about 33,000 years, whatever, we judge and we do it. What's going to happen when there's no more death, no more hell, no more whatever, right? Over in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, for he must reign till he hath put all, this is a time word, all in, and the last enemy that should be destroyed is what? Death. death. Then what? Now, he destroys death with the rapture for the body, but at the end of all, and in and, and, and Israel right here, but this is going to be fire. Death is going to be cast in like a fire. He reigns till. Then what, Dorothy? Then, well, let's, 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 let's end on that. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, since I brought it up. 1 Corinthians 15. Here's the most beautiful part about it. Isn't that interesting? My wife brought up, so I was just kind of looking through Paul's epistles about it. Verse number, 20, uh, verse, verse number 24. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have 
delivered up the kingdom to who? To God, God the, the Father, Father, even the Father, when he, has, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. What God created Adam to do in the earth, Jesus Christ is going to do in both heaven and earth, right? Earth through Israel and heaven through the body. Okay, now watch this. Verse 25, for he must reign, next word, till he hath put all the enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he, that's the Father, is accepted. So the only, the only person that's going to be not under Christ's feet is God the Father, which did put all things under him. So God the Father did. Verse 28, here's the answer. Yep. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son, what? Also. also himself be subject unto him that put all things unto him that, what? God, and that's the Father, might be all in all. Basically, what's going to happen, Dorothy? And, and I mean, it's, gonna, it's weird to say because we hardly think about it. But he's saying he's going to do all this until everything is done. And then... You're going to have perfection. Start all over. <laughs> I don't know. It's just going to be perfection. And like Ryan said, just be judging. I mean, we're just going to... I, we, we, it, it, this is the dispensation of the fullness of times after the rapture. That's going to go from the rapture to the end of the great white throne. Once everything is done, then it's going to be perfect peace that we cannot even understand and, and, and talk about. It. He's going to reign till everything and then be like, okay, Father. And I don't... It's just going to be... It's going to be like it would have been here. Just yeah. perfect peace and everybody doing everything God wants. It, it ain't going to be no need to beat somebody down with a rod of iron. There will be no sin. No, I mean, it's, it's just going to be, be forever. forever. And we can't even fathom like, no. what it's going to be like. Yeah. <laughs> but I saw that verse when Christy, because I think about it, because I looked up Rand. I was like, oh, he's gonna, it's going to be a long time now. Don't get me wrong. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we're part of that. Like, we have a part. But after everything, death and everything is done with, it's just going to be, a, it's going to be a different, it's going to be something so different that we can't even fathom, fathom or even yeah. speak. It's unspeakable. Yeah. It's only what God, how God lived before anything. That's how it's going to be. God is in his heaven and all is right in the world. Yeah. Look how the Godhead lived. The Father, He's going to be in charge, then the Son, the Holy Ghost, and they just, everybody's just going to just live for each other. It's just going to be something we've never experienced. But perfection, perfect love, charity lasts forever. Amen. Amen. And it starts now. If you, if you have never had anyone love you enough, it all starts with salvation. Enough to ask you, if you were to die today. See, you as a Gentile today, you, 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 the, the judgment of God is upon you. you. If you die, you're that close to a Christless eternity in hell on lake of fire. But God doesn't want you to die and go to hell. He wants, He loves you. He is love, but He's just and holy. God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God, that shed blood on Calvary will pay for your sin debt. You will never go to hell on lake of fire. No works of your own. Faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Trust Him. But now what to do with your life? Well, catch up, run, get in the race, man. You can get saved today and God will give us, if he gives us three more years of dispensation of grace, you can run past countless number of denominational pastors and people who have no clue if you just let allow us to help you. Read Paul's epistles, study along with us as we expound, get some understanding, some wisdom from Almighty God, wisdom of the mystery, understand what the Father is doing, Bear fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. You can do that. It doesn't take long. And then you get a full reward at the judgment seat. And then you'll qualify to reign in those positions of authority. But hey, even if you waste your life and you got saved, you'll be at, we're going to see next time every name that is named. You'll be in the kingdom. Now you won't have any, uh, you won't be a joint heir. You won't have, because you didn't suffer with them, that you might be also glorified together. You won't, you won't have any rule throughout that, that vast millennial years down there. You're going to be learning, but your, 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 yours is fixed. And, you know, whatever else happens after that, that's between the Father. I'm just telling you what he says there, okay? He wants you to go for that glory and win Christ. We'll help you with that. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, 
By the way, that brings glory to him when you, when you do what he says. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for the word of truth rightly divided. We thank you for the understanding of Paul's epistles as we rightly divide those issues of justification, which is a wonderful thing, but even a greater thing is our sanctification, our growth in Christ. We thank you that you have allowed us to share in that glory, to access that glory, the glory of God himself, not because of anything we do, but based upon the faith of Jesus Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And Father, we pray as with our apostle that we may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, that like as Paul prayed, that he might, we might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, the, that glory associated with the resurrection of the body of Christ. And we thank you, Father, for one another. We, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who aren't with us, but are with us in spirit through these studies. May we all press toward that mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. If Paul can do it after 30 plus years, who are we to not do the same? He says to, to do it because he's our pattern. He says to follow him in these things. So that's our prayer. We thank you for this time together. As we have our Q&A, we give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen.